So to our first speaker, uh, Regina Everett. So Regina is Assistant Chief Operating Officer and Director of Libraries, Archives and Learning Services at the University of East London. So concerned about the low representation of global ethnic minority staff members in leadership positions in academic libraries, she's chair of the Sconnell Committee to support member institutions in implementing the actions from the Sconnell Report on the experiences of BAME staff members in academic libraries. She's also a member of the British Library Council, a member of the SILIP Trailblazer Group that's developing a standard for level six to seven apprenticeships, and a member of the University of East London Board of Governors. Regina is going to talk today about the University of East London's approach to helping students develop digital skills that will help prepare them for their careers of the future. She's also going to discuss her approach to upskilling library staff members so that they're conference, confident in supporting students. Regina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much. As Valerie pointed out, um, I'm Regina Everett. I'm a Assistant Chief Operating Officer for Service Excellence at Director of Library Archives and Learning Services at the University of East London. I'm an African American woman with dreadlocks and wearing a brightly colored top today. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this conversation. So the topic today covers a, a number of strands. So I'm going to focus on the an overview on the approach that we are taking institutionally at the University of East London to upskill our students with um, so that they are digitally proficient. Now, like many comparator teaching and learning institutions, we at the University of East London strive to be the careers led institution. Now, in our case, however, we seek to serve our local communities in East London, as well as their diasporic, um, diasporic communities globally through research and partnerships. Now, the brand positioning of University of East London is tomorrow's 4.0 workforce today. So within Vision 2028, which is the university's strategic roadmap, there is a focus around digital competency and ultimately digital fluency. And so the call to action for our employer partners is, look, diversify your talent pool with our students who have the skills and the confidence to take on future careers. So students are the core of the Vision 2028. Now, what do we know about our students at the University of East London? Well, it's a diverse population uh, representing more than 130 countries. It's almost 70% Black, Asian, or minoritized, and minoritized ethnic. Most of the, the students are the first in their families to attend a uh, university. There's a large population of mature learners returning to education um, after many years. Uh, and like many students, they have responsibilities outside the academy, whether it's caring or working. And of course, we have a growing international student population. So I'm going to focus on three strands of implementation of our strategic objective to develop digitally competent graduates. Um, these are professional, fit, uh, professional fitness program, support, and that's support from peers as well as staff, and of course, staff development. Now, all students at University of East London, including those at our partner institutions, undertake what we call a mental wealth or professional fitness modules um, at each level to develop those soft skills, which will be required for the unknown jobs of the future. So you see all of these competencies there. Um, and each module within the program will explicitly refer to how these skills apply within the context, context of the practice. So today, of course, we're focusing on digital skills development, so focusing on the digital proficiency. proficiency. So examples of what could take place at each level was certainly at level three and four. Um, students could use the GIST capabilities tool or the SILIP professional knowledge, um, knowledge base and skills base to self-assess and to understand their own area of development 
and then start to use tools like LinkedIn Learning and for self-paced learning. And of course, we'll see later that there are other avenues for additional support. Level five can understand how digital skills are needed in their practice, starting to compare approaches, critiquing benefits and drawbacks. For example, students uh, may identify a real world problem, for example, using AI um, to shortlist applicants for jobs, for example, and then they can discuss the pros and cons of that. At level six, the students could develop a business plan for a digital solution to a problem. Um, and again, they will be using the language and the skills that they acquired in their earlier learning. And then finally, at seven, the students can create an innovation and showcase to, say, partners or our employer partners. And again, students continue to build on their previous knowledge within, within their practice. For the support element, um, peer support is a powerful method of student um, supporting students because students often feel more comfortable asking one another for support rather than asking staff members. So for support with digital skills development um, at University of East London, we started in 2019, the digital first aid program um, where digital first aiders are positioned within schools and the libraries for ad hoc drop-ins um, for to answer queries about the use of educational technologies. And during the pandemic, they provided online drop-in sessions as well. Now the digital first aiders are generally students who are confident in using IT and educational technologies such as Moodle, um, Turnitin, Cortex, Teams, Office 365, and they're able to assist students in developing their skills. The students are hired through our internal employment agency and on fixed term contracts. Now, beyond the support of the digital first aiders, students, of course, can seek support from the wider library team or their subject um, specialists within the library team. Um, they can also speak to members of the academic skills team um, and also their wider academic team. So there are a number of avenues where students can seek um, support. However, <laughs> we know that not all academic staff members are confident in using the ed educational technologies. And so they're not able to model the behavior for the usage of the tools. So we move on to staff de development. So we need to continuously develop our staff members. I mean, as the technology, technological landscape is so fast moving, there's a lot to keep abreast of. So certainly over the coming year, our library and archives uh, services team will be developing targeted programs to help academic staff members to optimize their use of the tools so that they can encourage students to use these tools. Um, and then, of course, we'll continue to work with our Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching um, to help to embed it within, within the schools um, and the school leadership team. Um, we do recognize that the academics or can be busy especially if they're um, hourly paid uh, lecturers. Um, so there will be that lack of time. So we'll have to, to work out how we can build that into staff development programs. Now for the library staff specifically, back in 2019, again, using that still a PKSB and the GIST capability tools, I created my own self-assessment tool. And I just used SurveyMonkey for this. I just needed to get an understanding of um, staff competency in their, you know, the areas that we were focusing on at the time. So these are just some examples of the target areas I wanted staff to um, give me an indication of how confident they felt um, in, in these areas. And then based on their input, I built a training program around the areas for development. And I involved our middle management team to help to identify facilitators for the sessions and also to build in a schedule um, which took, took place over the uh, a period of, of months, but could work around their sort of workloads. And then after the training, um, of course, we got feedback from staff members. And as ever, you know, many staff members felt confident in using this skill after the session, but there were still some staff members who needed additional support, especially if they weren't um, using the skills immediately. 
I'm pleased to say as well that our librarians particularly really embraced um, that development program and went further and took the Microsoft Educator Certification. And again, that validated them, how they um, use the global technology um, um, literacy uh, competencies and how they embedded that within, um, within their skills and practice and help them to deliver and de develop and deliver um, online content. So when the pandemic hit, uh, the entire team pivoted fairly seamlessly online. Um, so we, we were able to transition um, with, with, I think, minimal challenge, shall we say. Um, and then we continue to, to build on that. So again, you know, it's an iterative process. So we're continuing to build on the skills that we've developed to sort of enhance the, the, um, the, the content that we've developed so far. Um, and also to, again, help our students to really be able to embrace those future creative roles. And so again, as I said, is it is rinse and repeat. It is very much an iterative process. And as technology evolves, uh, we can review and evolve our practice. So thank you very much. I'll stop there and stop sharing my screen. Uh, Okay, I think we're good there. So thank you very much, Valerie. Thank you very much, Regina. That was really interesting. Uh, I've been scribbling away. Uh, I've got lots of questions. So uh, again, just to remind people, um, lots of things that was uh, already some things coming in. So so please do um, uh, add to the questions box with the things that have sparked your your interest and curiosity. So we move now on to our second speaker, Josie Fraser. So uh, Josie is head of digital policy at the National Lottery Heritage Fund, where she leads on the UK wide digital skills for heritage initiative, which is designed to drive up digital skills and confidence across the heritage sector and to ensure that organisations benefit from the effective use of technology. So Josie's career has focused on equitable and inclusive digital transformation. She's previously worked for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport as a senior advisor. And in 2017, she was awarded honorary life membership by the Association for Learning Technology in recognition of the impact and scope of her work as an educational technologist, particularly in relation to digital literacy. So Josie is going to talk today about how the National Lottery Heritage Fund's Digital Skills for Heritage Initiative and digital grant making, get all that out in one breath, are supporting and driving professional, organisational and sector wide digital skills development. And just to note before I hand over to Josie that she uh, has told us she's going to be sharing lots of links in her presentation. And we know these are quite difficult to, to note down so that the, uh, the admin team are going to be sharing these in the chat as Josie's um, talk proceeds, just to uh, make it a little bit easier for you uh, to listen to what she's saying. Uh, so on that note, I'm delighted to welcome Josie Fraser. Thank you so much, Valerie, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Absolutely delighted to be uh, here today. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman and I have a blonde bob hairstyle and uh, be remiss of me not, not to mention I have some beautiful fresh sunflowers in the background um, of my room, very fortunately at the moment. Okay, I'm going to quickly get into the video and this is going to be a reasonably uh, pacey gallop through um, a, a number of things I want to cover and share with you today. I'm going to talk about the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund's Digital Skills for Heritage Initiative. No, no surprises there. Uh, it's our it's our huge digital skills program. Um, I'm going to, as 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 Valerie indicated, I'm going to share loads of resources with you today, all of which are freely available, openly licensed. Please, please do make use of them. Please share them with people that you think they'll be of use to. Um, enjoy them and help us promote them. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our dash benchmarking. Um, survey, which um, we've we've um, which we've commissioned for the last two years, which is a really important, useful piece of research to anybody interested in digital skills in the glam sector or the broader heritage sector. 
So I'm from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. For those of you who haven't worked with us before, please do have a look at our website and see whether we may be able to support you in the future. We're the UK's largest funder of heritage projects. That includes the glam sector, but it also includes the wider heritage sector. So we also support uh, many, many land, land and nature projects, for example. We look at cultural heritage, um, community heritage and memories. A whole whole range of different areas as well and the digital skills for heritage program is designed to support the sector as a whole because um, as a distributor of national lottery funds we have um, we work to a, a framework of practice and one of the priorities within our framework is to indeed support the sector in developing digital skills and competencies um, mainly what I've been working on for the last two years since I've been with the um, organisation. So Digital Skills for Heritage um, programme uh, launched uh, Feb 2020, so just before we went into the pandemic. And um, it's, it's blossomed through the pandemic. As you can imagine, we were um, able to support provide a lot of timely support for lots of organisations. And it's now a 3.6 million initiative. Um, we had to pivot online. So the, uh, the initially the activities were planned to take place. A lot of them were kind of face-to-face -face type workshops and events and activities. Everything moved online uh, for, for, for the majority of the project. And, that, and in this, our final year, we are starting now to move back into kind of physical spaces as well. So the projects provide lots and lots of different things. The diversity of the initiative is really designed to match the diversity of the sector and the, the needs of the sectors that we're working with. But they focus on these kind of uh, five key areas, which are sector-wide digital skills training, um, dedicated mentoring and support. So that's really focusing on the very low confidence organisations that might be completely new to digital. Uh, we do a chunk of support for business and development and leadership work. Um, so really focusing on those kind of strategic aims and bringing along digital leaders within the sector. Um, we've got a whole big focus on research and online learning that I'm going to talk to a little bit more in a sec. And we also, we've just recently established exemplar cohort projects, and we have two of those. One of them is, is really, well, they're both is super interesting. Our newest one is uh, looking at how organisations can make use of digital volunteers to build their own capacity and obviously rethink their kind of um, models in terms of how they work and how they get support. Um, the um, the program has, has has done a huge amount in terms of contact time uh, and providing training, support, boot camps for individuals and organisations. But it's also generated thousands of learning resources, really great ones. These include a bunch of key sector guides that look at. Uh, safeguarding issues and, and e-safety issues, look at things like GDPR PR and um, security issues, data management. Um, online learning was a super popular topic when we went into lockdown with lots of organisations wanting to know a little bit more about online pedagogies and practices. Um, accessibility is another key one. And also we've done quite a lot of work around working with open licences. Uh, what I'd really like to flag, though, as well, if you haven't seen it yet, is we have a brand new, huge online learning centre, the Digital Heritage Hub. And within that, there are lots and lots of very short, bite-sized courses answering these 100 uh, digital questions around these four topics, engagement, content, leadership and planning. So please do do take a look at that. because Some great content in there. The Dash survey um, is uh, the first ever a UK wide benchmark of heritage sector digital skills um, that was carried out for the first time in 2020 um, and thousands of um, volunteers, employees, senior leaders and freelancers have taken part in that in, uh, in, in both years, but in, in our recent year in uh, 
2021, which we reported on. So the report didn't come in until January. Um, and there are some great opportunities identified in there. I'm going to just give you my highlights. Please, again, do go and have a look. There's some really, really useful data and information in there. But the headline things that are really important in terms of people thinking about skills in the sector are the sector is positive and motivated and that's obviously really important and the um, survey team identified the presence of what they've called digital enthusiasts so people who are keen to learn to do new things using digital to solve problems across all types of roles across the sector um, so we're, we're characteristically a positive sector about digital skills um, digital uh, business critical skills did improve over the sector over the last couple of years. Not a huge surprise to anyone uh, given the pandemic and given the uh, online pivots that took place and the, you know, the, the huge push for everybody to um, develop those skills. Um, there was a positive correlation between uh, participation or uh, engagement in our, pro, uh, in our initiative and increased skills, which was great news for us. Uh, senior leaders, had to focus on immediate rather than strategic innovative use of digital. Again, no surprise to anyone, although lots of signs that um, senior leaders are very keen to build on foundations developed during the pandemic. Um, and, and really also to point up, one of the findings was that there's lots of potential wins for looking at HR processes and, and recruitment in terms of building digital skills at organisational level. Um, the sector shared with us their top three priorities for the next year, and we're working kind of across the programme still for the next year to support and meet those needs. And um, please do take a look at our, our main sites. Please do sign up for our newsletters. Um, there's many opportunities coming over the next year and obviously a huge wealth of material for you also to explore. And I will I will finish there. Um, thank, thanks very much for the time. Thanks very much, Josie. That was excellent. And we're getting some comments in the chat saying that someone's saying they loved the, the idea of the digital enthusiast uh, and someone saying, wow, this is rich. So uh, that's obviously gone down very well. So thank you very much for that. So we now turn to our um, third and final speaker, last but very not, much not least, who's Alec Ward. And Alec is a digital skills manager at Culture24, and his career has focused on building capacity and confidence for smaller cultural organisations. I know we've got many of those here, so uh, I know uh, they'll be particularly interested in that, by providing digital skills and literacy, literacy support. Alex has got extensive experience designing training around practical digital skills development, from video editing, to creating 3D digital models and focuses that training through a wider organisational strategic context. So today, Alex is going to be discussing why it's necessary for the heritage organisations to understand digital maturity and the digital skills of staff, also the role that leadership can play in that process and the part that change makers within the organisation can play. So really interesting um, uh, presentation coming up. Alex, I'll pass to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Valerie, for that lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly and hopefully you can see my slides. So <clears throat> hello, all. I'm Alec. I'm a white male in his early 30s. I've got dark brown hair. Uh, I've got brown eyes. I've got a stubbly beard uh, with a slightly thicker moustache, which um, some might say is slightly inspired by the recent Top Gun movies. Um, and there's also a Day of the Triffid style rubber plant. Uh, sort of creeping up behind me um, and I'm the digital manager uh, digital skills manager at culture 24 we've been considering the roles of uh, digital skills and literacy within the sector for some time uh, we see digital skills as being about people the individual the group and, and not about technology on its own because technology is ever changing uh, the but the importance of the people using that technology that that remains the same you know how do they use it how do they understand it those sorts of questions and all of this is very much linked to digital maturity. You know, how do the organizations that we work for use digital tools and technologies? And, and how do our organizations support the people uh, within, within them to do that work? So I want to start off by highlighting how the digital skills of the people working within your organization are sort of intrinsically uh, linked 
to the digital maturity of those organizations because digital is very much people centered and digital maturity is about the the culture of an organization um, uh, as much as it is about technology itself and the challenge of course is, is sort of knowing uh, how to build the necessary skills and how to develop the maturity of our organizations and i can't answer that in 10 minutes and um, but i can at least point you in the right direction and give you a few things to think about um, as you sort of start that journey so as a founding partner in the university of leicester's uh, one by one project we've spent the last five years or so uh, developing testing and iterating our ideas around digital and from that we've developed a number of framings uh, centered around digital skills and you can see one of those framings on the slide there, uh, the, the triangle, and it breaks down the three different and distinct elements of digital skills, um, our competencies, capabilities, and, and our literacies. And, and breaking down those skills using this framing is, is a practical activity that you can do yourself um, or with your teams. And I've popped a bit.ly link on the, skill, uh, on the screen there uh, to a guide on how to use this framing. Um, and I'm not gonna go into detail now on how it works, but if you're interested, um, it's a very detailed guide and it will, it will tell you how to sort of break down your own skills uh, using it. And it's important to know that it's not necessary for everyone to have all of these digital skills at the same time across all activities. Um, but it is important for all three areas to be covered across an organization. And, and that's when we start getting into the realms of digital maturity. And but before we start talking about uh, digital maturity of our organizations, I just wanted to highlight a few things worth uh, thinking about when we're considering our digital skills. Um, so, so as Josie and Regina have, have already mentioned, most organizations will have a sort of digital champion or, or agents of change and um, the people who drive digital change from within. And um, these people, you know, they usually have strong digital skills and they, they often act as bridges across the organization to sort of bolster the skills of others. Um, but this work is often unseen. It's often unstructured and it, and it usually takes a lot of sort of emotional labor um, from the individuals involved. Um, so we want to make sure that we are identifying and supporting these individuals um, so that their work doesn't go unseen. You know, we want to take some of the, the weight off of their shoulders and prioritize their work organizationally and, and give them space and, and time to develop. And then on the other side of the coin, you have your organizational leaders, you know, your senior managers, directors, trustees. How digitally literate are these individuals? Now, we've been supporting leaders with digital for a number of years, um, most recently through our National Lottery Heritage funded uh, leading the sector program. Um, and we've learned that whilst leaders may not necessarily be the people doing the digital stuff, and um, they do need to build their own digital literacy to a point where they can create the conditions for change and, and sort of value skills development internally and understand the strategic benefits of, of digital maturity. And as Josie said in, in her presentation, the last few years, digital interventions, they've been much more reactive. Um, but now's the time to, to make sure that these are more strategic. And then finally, how can you as a leader or as a champion or, or a, a, a change maker support digital skills sharing and development? The best place to, to start is to look for the sector for advice and inspiration. And Regina just um, gave an excellent example of identifying and prioritizing digital skills within an organization. But outside of direct case studies at Culture24, we've got a, a free to access digital pathways resource bank. You already heard Josie talking about all of the fantastic uh, resources that the National Lottery Heritage Fund has through their Digital Skills for Heritage program. Arts Council England has the Digital Culture Network. National Archives has um, plugged in, powered up. I think you sort of get the picture that there's a lot of support out there. Um, but the key is finding the right support at the right time. And doing that takes a bit of awareness around what's available in the sector. And um, so I always suggest joining networks and communities of practice, uh, like the Museum's Computer Group, as an example, or the Digital Learning Network. Um, so that you can keep in touch with what's going on and building digital skills is about building confidence it's about confidence in what you know you know as well as in the fact that you don't know everything and that that is very much okay um, but it's also important that we have confidence in not just ourselves but in our organizations as well and um, that they'll have the maturity to adapt and thrive uh, in the constantly changing digital landscape and and that is what organizational digital maturity is all about it's about the resilience, capacity, and ability of an organization to uh, respond to changing technologies, audience behaviors, culture, platforms, uh, tools. And there's a few ways that we can measure our digital maturity. And, and one of the tools that we can use is the Digital Culture Compass, which was commissioned by National Lottery Heritage Fund and the Arts Council and uh, developed by a number of stakeholders, in, including ourselves at Culture24. And the Digital Culture Compass looks at digital maturity within the context of 12 activity areas. Uh, from HR to collections management and through this tool you can assess your digital maturity in each of these activity areas and it helps to sort of build up an overall picture 
of organizational maturity and it also lets you send, uh, set benchmarks for sort of future targets. And when it comes to the relationship with digital skills, when we think about that skills triangle, you, you've got the sort of digital literacy at the top and the competency and the capabilities at the bottom. We want to make sure that our organization has an even spread of capabilities, competencies and literacies in the right place at the right time. Um, so I do recommend checking out the digital culture compass because it's a great starting point, but there are other maturity indexes available. So what should we be thinking about when we're thinking about our digital maturity? Um, we want to be thinking about where digital sits within our organization, what kind of model you use, you know, is the responsibility for digital dispersed across your organization, or is there a sort of central department which acts as a hub for those activities? And then we also want to consider how this model sort of impacts the people that do that work. Um, and then however you use digital tools, platforms, technologies, you know, wherever it's based, it's important that it supports your organizational strategy. You know, what are you trying to achieve as an organization? What are your aims, objectives, goals? And, and where does digital fit within all of that? Um, a, a digitally mature organization would see digital as a, as a tool to help them achieve their, their strategy. And then linked to that strategic approach is the necessity to assess those various activities and review them against the strategy to see how effective they are um, in, in achieving it. You know, digital is more than just IT and it's more than just marketing and communications. It's, it's used across every aspect of our organization's you know, daily. Um, so, so it's important that we understand and assess how effective it is in, in achieving what we want to achieve. Finally, I just wanted to wrap up with um, by drawing your attention to a new guide that we worked on with Europeana's Digital Transformation Task Force, uh, because it's very much relevant to, to what we're talking about today. And um, the guide offers three key recommendations to help frame an approach to digital transformation and for the whole of the culture sector in Europe. Um, but these recommendations are really relevant to all aspects of digital and um, from skills to maturity. So the first thing that we talk about is sharing a common language and approach within your organization to all aspects of digital, because this very much helps bring people together um, to understand challenges, align objectives and, and sort of understand and build capacity. We want to make sure that people are at the very center of, of what we're doing. Um, secondly, positive change that supports digital capacity building is, is much more effective when it happens in a people centered way. You know, looking at holistically at everyone's needs, everyone's roles, from volunteers to, to senior leaders, um, as well as the communities and the audiences that we serve. And then finally, thinking about um, purpose and values, you know, most fundamentally, that the, the culture, cultural heritage sector needs to build digital capacity in order, and understanding in order to be more resilient, you know, remain relevant and thrive in the 21st century. And this very much means about uh, making an impact and a difference to the people who visit and, and use our services. Um, so, so it needs to be driven by organizational mission, you know, purpose, values, just like everything else within our services. And you'll notice that these recommendations, much like everything else that I've highlighted today, are about uh, aren't about technology. You know, it's about our approach to technology as individuals, as organizations, and what that means for our audiences and our communities. So on the screen there, there's um, some uh, suggestions for further resources, and there's a bit.ly link and a QR code, which you can scan with your phone if you'd like. And that takes you to a Google Doc, which has links out to all of these and, and a few more. And, and just to say that there's lots of ways that we can develop our own digital skills, you know, the skills of, of our colleagues and the maturity of our organizations. And but these things never happen effectively or successfully in a silo. So, you know, think about the language that you're using, start a conversation with your colleagues um, today and use that shared language. Talk openly about your digital skills and the maturity of your organization. You know, think about your own direction, are you sort of open to learning and collaboration? Where do you want to go with your digital skills? But also think about the, the direction of your organization. You know, is it moving in the right direction or is it, going, is it struggling? Is it going to be left behind? So uh, thanks very much for listening. I hope that I've given uh, you a few things to think about and a few places to start answering some of those questions and more than happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Or you can drop me an email, send me a tweet. Thank you very much, Alec. Um, and can I uh, invite you to stay online and also invite um, Regina and Josie just to turn their microphones and cameras um, back on so that we can move into the Q&A um, part of the session. So I'll wait till that happens. Let's see. I've got, I've got a view when I can't see anyone yet. Oh, there we go. That's better. Can I, actually, I see you all. Just, just a, it's a positive move. Um, so thanks very much. There's loads of stuff um, coming in the chat about how positively all of all three of those um, presentations have been received and, and lots of questions coming in. 
Um, but I'm going to use the chair's privilege to, to start. So, um, uh, Regina, you you talked quite specifically about this. So I'm going to start start with you and then um, move to the others. What what do you mean? Because we've talked about digital skills. What do you mean by by digital skills? And do you think there's a kind of common understanding of of, of what that means? And does that matter? Um, Regina, I'll go to you as I say first on that one because you you had your in your presentation quite a, a, a specific list of of competencies and skills. Yeah, I mean, I do agree that it is. It is quite broad, you know, and again, as an information specialist, I always want to have that information literacy in there as well so that people can um, critically analyze the information that they manage to uh, um, retrieve. But it does range from everything from, you know, just, you know, being able to use within my um, higher education tech, um, um, landscape, the educational technologies and exploit exploit that so that you can enhance your learning. Um, but it also from an organizational uh, context, just looking at how you run your business, you know, how efficient, efficient you can make your um, processes um, using technology. So it's, it's kind of a, a range of things. But I think in if one wanted to be really reductive is is the non physical. <laughs> so but that's why I say it becomes very, very broad. Um, when we're speaking about digital landscape. Thank you very much. I'll go to Josie next and then to Alex. So Josie, your thoughts on what a digital Hi. is. Thanks for the question. Um, I um, I liked Alex's um, approach to the, the pyramid um, with digital literacy and capability and confidence on the top as a way of kind of approaching skills. I thought that was useful. My background is in educational technology and I'm very, very um, familiar with working with digital maturity frameworks and kind of thinking about digital literacy and what that means in different sectors. So kind of my, uh, I think there's some there's some amazing frameworks out there to help organisations. I also think that um, uh, what digital skills are is quite site specific. The DASH survey goes a step further and says it's role specific. So have a look at kind of how they chop it up. But for me, I, I always tend to slice the pie uh, in three ways. One, basic digital literacy, which is literally the functional things that everybody needs to just do to, to be a part of a digital society and without which there's, 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 there is digital exclusion. So that's things like, you know, sending emails, uh, online banking. And, and these are things that many of us take absolutely for granted, but actually skills profiles still vary across different organisations and different places. So we shouldn't be taking those, those things for granted. But for me, that's the kind of uh, the, the really fundamental layer. The next layer up for me would be uh, around um, the kind of specific and um, the specific and, and, and somewhat specialist items for a professional role. So for the glam sector, that's going to be a lot to do with um, things like understanding online accessibility, understanding data management in terms of your legal responsibilities, understanding um, open licensing. These are all kind of critical elements that will cut across the types of specialist use that you're going to make of, um, of technologies, whether you're digitizing things or whether you're um, sending out comms or whether you're um, looking at linking your digital investment to your organizational strategy, you still need those quite spe higher specialist level skills, I think. And then the, 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 the final level is things that not everybody in the organization is going to need to know or, or will, will find useful, but they are very specific to the glam professions and they're you know they they come along with lots of kind of software and processes and hardware that that are specific a lot of the time to our sector and the kinds of processes like um you know biodiversity data or uh working with um working with uh, 3D digitization or whatever those kinds of things may be. And obviously, or, or any organization really needs to make sure that they have got the fundamentals in place. And then my advice would be to really look at raising that middle level and understanding how, how your organization is coping with that. Thanks, that's really interesting and useful. Alec? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with both um, what Regina and Josie have said, you know, with when it comes to digital skills, you can't be prescriptive because, you know, digital changes all the time. The things that people need to know today, they might not need to know 
in a month's time, or there might be something completely new, which is why we took the approach uh, with the, the skills framing, the triangle, thinking about literacies, capabilities and, and competencies. And um, because that doesn't talk about the technology or the platform, it talks about your approach um, to, to the thing that you're doing, to the activity that you're doing. So just to give like a non-digital example of how it would work, um, your competency would be your ability to use a hammer, wood and nails, for instance, your understanding of those tools, your capability would your would be your ability to use those materials, the hammer, wood and nails to build something like to build a chair, for instance. And then your literacy would be your ability to take a step back and to look at the chair you've built and think to yourself, actually, we wanted more people to be able to sit on this. We should have built a bench. Um, and, and that's what that triangle is about. You know, it's about taking that sort of holistic look at the skills that you and your organization have and making sure that you've got the right people in the right place at the right time. Excellent. Oh, we, we could, gosh, there's loads to follow up there, um, but there are lots of questions coming in and I want to make sure that I cover some of the ones from the audience, not just my own. Um, so first up, we've got one uh, specifically for, for Regina, um, someone who's, who's said an excellent presentation. Thank you very much and great to hear how you've um, been supporting staff. Um, so the, the person you're asking the question has asked if you could speak a little bit more about any provisions and support for students and also staff with access accessibility issues um, and that might be disability socioeconomic issues or, or anything else or if you if you've got plans to do that so um, could we come to you specifically on that one Regina? Yes I mean so again we've got sort of you know sort of resources into technologies specifically um, for um, you know sort of users who may have different uh, disabilities we've got um, a disability support unit where students can get support but we also um, periodically will have uh, someone who does drop-ins to help the students really to get get the most out of their um, sort of digital assistive technologies um, Again, you know, there's, you know, sort of institution level sort of uh, training so that we can, um, you know, just test what, you know, understand what what additional needs um, um, that we should be considering. And we also have students or students are our big, biggest advocates. Um, for example, in one of our libraries, we had um, a group of students that, uh, you know, gave us a, a, a lot of feedback about the spaces that we identified and used for assistive technology. So we tried to um, co-create with students within that space. Um, so the aim really is to not to have it segregated, to always have it as a, 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 a prism that we look through when we're looking at any skills development. Um, but again, always, you know, looking to our students to give us additional feedback on areas where we, we may have, um, you know, we need to improve. Yeah, I mean, I, I loved, again, we probably don't have time to follow it up. I love the digital first aiders and also the kind of reverse mentoring and the staff and student interaction and the your kind of circle at the end which I thought was uh, lovely so we may if we've got time I'll come back to that but I've got loads of in the uh, from other people so I'll, I'll carry on with those to be fair to the audience um so somebody has asked about infrastructure do we have the infrastructure obviously we know that particularly during COVID there's been a huge sort of explosion of of, of demand and provision online um and particularly um, again all, each of you can speak to that in in, in your different skill areas and um, so do we have the infrastructure to meet emerging demand in the digital landscape? And I'll, I'll come to you, Alec, first, and perhaps particularly that might be relevant to your work with smaller institutions. Um, the answer is yes and no and everything in between. It, it really depends on the organisation. Um, as, a, as a sector, we're getting better. Um, but I think the, the, the pandemic very much highlighted that there's a lot of organisations that do not have the infrastructure. Um, to, to, to do the digital things that they need to do. The, the key for me is, it, it comes back to that question around digital maturity, and it's, it's about understanding where you need to prioritise your resources. Um, over the last two years, a lot of heritage organisations, um, glam organisations, they, they sort of jumped into to digital, you know, posting content, creating lots of really exciting um, digital experiences. And then very quickly realize that actually they don't have the capacity to, to maintain and manage these things. And some of it was very good and some of it was not so good. Um, and uh, for me, the key is, is thinking about your digital maturity, thinking about your activity areas and understanding what you're trying to achieve as an organization and focusing your resources to do those things. You know, it's, it's perfectly fine to not be all singing and all dancing 
um, you know, on social media, if you can focus your resources and have an excellent website that people can sort of come to, the, to there and get, get that information. So again, it's, it's about priorities and prioritizing effectively. Thank you, Joseph. I'm going to go to you next on this. Thanks. This is a great question. Um, I love I love this question because for me, skills is is one part of the puzzle, and I think it's really really important that we don't think, oh, you know what, all we need to do is give skills to our staff and everything's going to be perfect because um, it's not going to be not uh, not every organization can support every possible digital skill nor should they have to and lots of um, you know organizations that that we see are overburdened with things that could be, be done much better at scale anyway so the 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 kind of um, the digital ecosystem that supports the sector is really, really important. It's immature at the moment. However, there are some great organizations providing really vital services and doing bits of things for people. Um, I would love to see many more of those services emerge. I think the Towards a National Collection work is doing some great job in identifying where those service gaps currently lie. Um, it, it has to be something that we, as a country, uh, uh, as, a, as the UK, are supporting rather than pushing back on to individual organisations. Um, and, and because we, we just then, we, we're overburdening people, we're missing economies uh, of scale, and we're, we're driving down quality sometimes rather than driving it up. It's really interesting. Regina, your thoughts? I mean, absolutely echo um, that, you know, shared services is definitely a part of the equation. Of course, each institution within a higher education context will want it, their own UX, USP. Um, there's never enough money, um, let's face it. And the, the challenge within the higher education institutions is that you're looking at, a, you know, a, a couple of different sort of areas. You're looking at sort of the you know, running it as a business process, but also you want to have a like sort of a sand pit environment because you're trying to challenge your students to to you know um, think think toward the future, and they need the tools to be able to do that, and they need the space to be able to do that. Um, I'm glad that we've moved away from the old sort of. MIS, oh my God, we can't allow students to have certain activities that will, you know, impact the firewall. Thankfully, we we pretty much moved away from that. But again, you know, as I said, there's always, you know, there's never enough money to do all the things you want to do. Uh, that's really, really interesting. I'm uh, uh, sadly accurate. Um, so I'm going to stick with you, Regina, because there's one that, that's come in um, around upskilling and the kind of consequences of that, which I'm going to start with where, with you on. So uh, Neil has asked, um, one sensitivity for organisations, so obviously, if you do upskill your staff, they they can become a flight risk because they with these newly found uh, brilliant skills they have, they can go off and, uh, you know, pos possibly earn loads of money elsewhere. What what can be done to kind of mitigate that if, if an institution or a skills program has has invested so much in in individuals and then and then they they leave because because you've made them so much more skilled and therefore valuable so I'll start with you Regina on that one well I would from from a personal perspective I welcome that that's I, I welcome the fact that we've developed individuals who feel so confident that they want to sort of go and spread their wings so but I, I realize that you know that does impact organizational resilience but also, it opens opportunities for other people who might be developing because let's face it, within um, libraries in particular, you oftentimes will have very low attrition. Let's talk about the people with the digital skills that you have. Those are the people that we worry about and where we're based, they all go to Canary Wharf or, you know, they will, um, you know, may say, listen, I'm never going to come into the office. So if you can't allow me to work from home, I will never work there. And that, I think that's the, the challenge. That is why having different modes, uh, ways to be able to get people into um, roles, um, you know, using our student population within the higher education context to sort of develop them and maybe give them initial starts and roles. We just have to be a lot more creative about where we get people and also having an environment where people might want to stick around for a while um, and understanding from staff members what it would take to do that. For some staff members, the thing that they need is to move on. And I certainly celebrate that. But, you know, where I can have the conversation before someone leaves, is there anything that I could do differently that would um, um, make you interested in staying? Then I'm happy to have that conversation. That's a really, really important point. Um, 
I'm going to come to you, Josie, next on that one. Uh, I think progression routes are really important, and um, because of where we are, kind of in the in 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 uh, in terms of digital maturity as a sector, the progression routes are potentially not always there for individuals, and they are having to transfer out to move up in their careers. And and I think no um, no no manager who's worth their salt would would be upset that people get better and want to move up that's that's literally you know the sign that you've done a good job being a manager that they're that they're um, achieving and that they're they're interested in what they do I think there is a there is a obviously um from the point of view of an organization it's very difficult if you're losing staff and you're having to take time to recruit but you know I, I think it's definitely one that we need to think about um collectively and, and think about as a sector and where we're developing and moving people around as a whole sector, um, uh, you know, and, and maybe this is a really, really important area where we don't just talk to ourselves, where we do connect with other similar organisations and networks and think about those routes in and out for people so that we can make sure that as a sector, as a whole, we're upskilling in terms of digital. Yeah, and and to pick up on what Regina said as well, presumably if we all work together kind of cooperatively, people might, even though people might move on, you might gain yourself from the skills from being an attractive employer or a uh, um, higher education institution from someone else's so that there, there'll be a kind of mutual benefit. So you might lose, but you'll gain in other places. So um, uh, yeah, hopefully there's a bit of that, of that. Alec, your thoughts on that one? I, to, to be honest, I haven't got a huge amount to add because um, Josie and, and Regina covered it. Um, very well. I think the the only thing I would say is that there are things that you can do to to sort of look at embedding skills um, within organisations to to sort of try and share the the skills and expertise that some individuals might have with with other members of staff. Um, something that you could look to, but you know it's not always effective, not always efficient, and and it can also be quite a large burden on the people that do have those skills to sort of actively share them. Um, and then sort of just to open it up one issue that I see a lot for smaller organizations is the sort of reliance on volunteers and to bring in the digital skills that they need for their organizations that they don't have in sort of permanent and paid staff again I've not got an answer for that but it's almost like a whole other can of worms um you know the the sort of reliance on 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 volunteer work for for these sorts of for these sorts of tasks and skill sets I'm I'm gonna stay with you Alec because actually we've had a question from Herbert um in which is kind of um is analogous to that sort of links to that so um he's actually asked Reg regina so i'll come to you uh, uh after i've spoken to, to alec um around how do we help people who, who don't have access to kind of it at all you know so that the issue of it poverty which is kind of linked to, to the volunteers you know so that obviously if you're a student or a member of staff there will be a certain infrastructure we talked about infrastructure but what about people who who have you know and again you know josie talked about this with the kind of foundation levels and, and then moving mm. up what what about IT poverty people hit the sort of digital exclusion issue if we like um, which links to, to your volunteers so Alec I'll start with you and then um, move to Regina and Josie on that one. Yeah that's a that's a very difficult um, question to ask in the sense that it's a sort of myriad of things isn't it it's um, you know something that organizations can potentially provide if they have the the sort of capacity and the resources to do so but not every organization does um it's something that perhaps you know government should be looking into the the sort of the digital divide is a, is a big issue for for society in general you know not just within this sector but wider sectors too um and i guess that as, a, as an organization that the, the one thing that you could do if you don't have the resources is to at the very least look for charities or organizations that may have the resources to help support these people you know Quite often libraries, for instance, will give out um, free hotspots, free 4G hotspots that people can use to connect um, to the internet with. And they can sort of borrow them for a month and have a sort of stable internet connection from those. So that there are sort of initiatives out there. Um, it's just uh, a bit of a challenge to sort of get it all in one place so that, that people can use it effectively. Thank you, Regina. I'm going to come to you next on that one. Yeah, I mean, our IT director, poor woman, she became Amazon at one point, um, just getting laptops and, and, and you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of 
what is it, uh, dongles out to people um, um, during during the pandemic. Um, so that that's the first thing that was done for both staff and students. Um, and I will say that the university did have end up having a central pot, so we didn't have to from our services come up with the funding for that. So we 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 um, there were some things that we were able to redirect so that we can put together an institutional pot for staff and students. The other thing um, is that we were you know very quick as soon as um, we were able to some restrictions were lifted we got those buildings open again um, for those people who needed to come in because it's all well and good me giving you a laptop and a dongle but if you're in a one bedroom flat with you know four family members all you know sort of um, needing to use the space is challenging so that's why keeping the libraries open that's why supporting our local libraries was so ever so important and that's why we don't want to see them disappear because people do rely on going to those spaces to get headspace to do work. So, I mean, you know, so those were two of the, the, the key um, quick, quick areas that we were able to support both staff and students. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Josie, when it comes to you on that one. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it very quickly. Um, I think, yes, it needs to be much more of a national priority in terms of um, other, other countries approach the um, the issue differently and there's some great uh, international examples of ways that we can kind of um, support everybody in getting online but the other thing that I would say is that actually the UK has some amazing organizations working in this area who have done lots of research that are very active that are great so if it is an area that you're, you're concerned about which we all should be look at their research look at whether there's opportunities to partner with them because they, there's you know there's some great people with a lot of knowledge already um, that we don't have to as a sector just find all these things out uh, for ourselves there's lots of work going on and then the third point is absolutely Regina's point support your local library support libraries nationally support the library, library service um, they are they're something we cannot afford to lose that has been corroded over the last decade or so. Um, you know, if you, if you care about the digital divide and access to knowledge and information, do stuff for libraries, whatever it is, just do something to support libraries. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stay with you, um, Josie, because um, somebody's put a question up asking about um, qualifications and, and their sort of linked to skills. So I mean, each of you has a different an, an interesting perspective on this, uh, particularly when, when we were talking uh, in, in part of the conversation earlier about being able to transfer those skills. How much does that develop on having a certificate, something that you say, I have done this, I've got this qualification, whatever. So uh, the person has asked, how much of the skills come from qualifications? Uh, and is it therefore fair to, to have professional qualifications as a requirement in job descriptions? So um, I mean, you could broaden the question if you like as, as to how much. I mean, each of you provides skills um, in your own particular context. Do you have something that people can take with them, like a certificate or a, a, a kind of name that they have they've achieved? Because often if you don't, then it's it's all right saying, oh, I've done a course in this or whatever. People do want a thing often if it, an employer will want a, a kind of piece of paper. So what's your what's your kind of attitude and, th and thoughts ar around that or, you know, or whether that becomes part of the digital divide? Josie, I'll stay with you since you're um, you have the camera. Um, so I'll, I'll speak from the point of being quite old. When I came into working technology, there wasn't the qualification. There wasn't anything to do. You know, it was literally spend a lot of time online have a go at some HTML. It was literally around there. And, and you know, I based my career on that. And, you know, I've carried on learning um, informally as I've gone. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, I think, and there's, and there's lots of people that I really rate in terms of the consultants, in terms of sector professionals that don't have direct uh, formal qualifications, but obviously have huge, huge experience. Um, in terms of formal qualifications, I think, you know, obviously we're very, very supportive of them and they provide structure and they provide experience and they do provide um, the kind of rec the formal recognition that is valuable. However, um, you know, there is a move uh, in some circles in terms of HR away from just requiring formal qualifications because experience is as valuable uh, in, in some or many cases as qualifications. So uh, I think 
Uh, yeah, I've just seen in the chat somebody said some job adverts still uh, ask for ECDL. Uh, not to be mean, but I think that that's a, not a good sign if you see that as a requirement. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I think it's, it's always going to be a mix. There are going to be qualifications now. So, for example, you can take lots of different types of qualifications in being an educational uh, te technologist that weren't around when I set out. Um, and they're great, you know, and I would encourage people to take advantage of the fact that they're there. Things are always going to change. Things are always going to develop. I'll, I'll stop there because I'm sure other people have opinions on that. Uh, Regina, I'm going to go to you next on that one. Well, I mean, again, it, it, and again, it goes back to that. You know, so it depends what the role is. I mean, obviously, if I'm, you know, hire you to do Python and you've not got a clue and we do a test of some sort, um, I'm sorry, you won't get the job. Um, but there are ways, you know, again, you know, within within libraries, you know, some of the, the work that our digital first aiders are doing, providing that frontline support, that is absolutely transferable. And that is absolutely sort of job experience that they can take with them to, to their next role. And it doesn't have to be linked to a specific, you know, sort of um, qualification. But again, I think it really does depend on what they do and what level um, of knowledge we, and experience we need for that role. Great, thank you. I think that's, that's an excellent point. Alec, I'll come to you on that. Yeah, I just uh, agree entirely with both what Regina and, and, and Josie have said. The um, uh, sort of from me, my personal experience, I don't have any sort of formal qualifications outside of um, a couple degrees uh, in history and museum studies. So that's um, you know not overly related to uh, to digital in any way. And um, all of the skills that I've sort of learned and and that I teach and, and coach around, I've I've sort of developed over time. You know, through personal experience, through um, hobbies, and also through my work. And uh, I probably, you know, wouldn't have got to what the role that I'm in now had organisations asked for, uh, you know, qualifications. Um, and and I think it very much does speak back to that sort of digital divide. You know, the 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 fact that there's going to be people who don't have access to things um, that that they need to be able to do the roles that they could easily do. You know, in a developmental um position as they sort of like build up the skills that they need and that they have and uh you know the, the the sector that we work in very much does perpetuate that that idea that there's a need for qualification and that is changing but uh i yeah personally don't think there is a necessity for it okay and we're running out of we have slightly run out of time and be told we can run a few minutes over so um uh, there are still unfortunately a few questions in the q a that we're not going to get round to um there are some specific ones which people um uh, might might wish to pick up outside the conversation but i wanted to end by asking each of you and i'm gonna i'm gonna go alec josie regina so you so you've got time to think um about about change because you've all been really kind of active but conscious pioneers of change in, in your own context in a really successful and, and kind of incredibly impressive and, and a brilliant way and i wanted to finish by asking you um Kind of was that a conscious thing and what can other people do to kind of emulate that that kind of like ability to just say, i'm gonna i'm gonna do something i'm gonna make a change and and you've all you've all done it um in, in an incredibly impressive way so alec i'll start with you first yeah well uh, um coach 2024 20, we very much approach everything that we do from a from a position of experimentation the idea that uh, what we're trying out is an experiment and we'll do it and learn from it and and then we'll sort of iterate uh, based on the results and I think that very much comes from a from a willingness to change and to, to be open to change um, and and digital and technology you know is ever changing so if you're not in a position that you can change um, or that you're open to change then uh, there's a good chance you're going to be sort of stuck in the mud I guess. Thank you Josie. Um, personally, I'm really driven to help people do things better and to get better public value. Um, and at this historical point in time, digital transformation offers so many opportunities for organisations to reach more people, to get kind of better social inclusion um, and, and just to, to kind of 
have a fairer organisations and practices. So I've been on the edge of that for that reason. In terms of change, I'd, I'd really say, you know, as well, it's 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 four percent technology and it's ninety percent psychology. People don't really like change, and you know, I think a, a thing if you if you're wanting change, lasting change, you have to be really interested in people um, and and helping them kind of transition through things because maybe us uh, the three of us may not be typical um of of lots of people um even even though I myself very often find change a bit painful as well thank you that's uh, a really insightful thank you Regina going to come to you finally well typical uh sort of librarian lifelong learner um curious so um watching my son who's in his early 20s and the nieces who are sort of 12 and 13 uh how they consume information just fascinates me and so it just tells us what we can see coming down the pike in the HE sector and we've got to be ready to address it <laughs>